Hello everyone, welcome back to another video. In my previous video, I introduced you to my Retro app and demonstrated how to use it. Check it out if you haven't already done so. Today, in this video, I will show what goes on behind the scenes of the Retro app. As I indicated in the previous video, there is more than just the app itself. There is also a network of distributed services that ensures the overall system's functionality. I'll go into detail about this infrastructure and show you how temperature, rain and other information end up on your smartphone. First, let's start with a quick overview of the infrastructure. You will notice it's divided into three distinct areas. The first one is the public area, representing devices that run the Weather App's user interface. Since we already talked about that in the last video, I will skip it for now. The other ones are the central and the local areas. The local area is where every weather record begins, outside at the weather station. In my weather app I use typical commercial weather stations, which include outdoor sensors and an indoor receiver unit. The outdoor sensors send a wireless signal approximately every 3 minutes, containing the current measurements. The receiver unit collects these measurements, converts them into a readable digital format and stores them. But what kind of sensors are there and how are the measurements utilized to obtain understandable weather data? The first sensor is a thermal hygrometer. This sensor captures the temperature and the relative humidity. Typically, the sensor is covered by a solar radiation shield to prevent it from heating up in direct sunlight, which could distort the measurement. On top of that, there is a funnel that collects water during rainfall. This water flows into a small bowl with two compartments. This bowl functions like a seesaw. Incoming water fills one compartment until its weight reaches a critical limit, causing it to tilt and pour out the water. Then, the other compartment fills with water and the cycle continues. Every time the seesaw tilts, a sensor detects the movement and increases a counter by 1. The value of this counter is then multiplied by a constant value with the unit millimeters per square meter. This constant value is determined by the amount of water the seesaw can hold until it tilts, as well as the intake area of the funnel. Next, there are two sensors for wind measurement. The first one is the vane, which determines wind direction by measuring the vane's orientation in degrees from 0 to 360. The second sensor is a cup anemometer used to assess wind speed. As the wind turns the cups, a sensor detects a full rotation measuring the time between signals. This, combined with the circumference of a cup's path in a rotation, calculates wind speed. Additionally, other sensors may be included, such as a solar radiation sensor or a barometer to measure air pressure. As mentioned earlier, the receiver unit is responsible for converting and storing the data. To integrate this data into the weather app, it needs to be transferred to the center area first. There are different methods to do that. Certain station types come equipped with a receiver unit capable of directly sending weather data over the internet via HTTP. This method is the simplest as it requires no additional hardware or setup. For station types lacking this built-in functionality, a Raspberry Pi, which is a single board computer, is connected to the receiver unit via USB. On this Raspberry Pi, I've implemented a microservice called Weather App Producer. This microservice reads and processes the data from the receiver before sending it over the internet via HTTP. I've also introduced a third station type. This type represents stations that also send data directly over the internet, but without the need for an additional receiver unit. These could be an IP camera or another Raspberry Pi with thermometers to measure soil temperature. Now that we have covered the local area, let's explore what happens with the data transmitted by the data stations to the central area. The primary interface used by the local area is a microservice called Weather App Consumer. This application receives HTTP requests sent by the data stations and processes them. To distinguish the requests, each station must authenticate with the consumer, using a unique key or other credentials included in the requests. By using individual credentials or keys, the consumer can accurately identify and assign requests to the corresponding station. Once authenticated, the consumer validates the data sent by the station and proceeds to store it in a database. The database itself is an integral component of the Weather App Core, essentially serving as the brain of the Weather App. Initially, the data received by the consumer is stored in a raw format, preserving each record as it arrives. Each record is tagged with a timestamp representing the time of reception, along with an identifier indicating the originating data station. To transform this raw data into a usable format, the Weather App Aggregator application comes into play. This service is tasked with grouping records into summaries for various time periods, such as hours, days, months and years. It continuously monitors the database for new records, 
aggregates them for the specified time period and stores them once again in the database. The aggregated data is now ready for use and can be accessed over the internet via the Weather App API service. This service provides an interface that the Weather App UI utilizes to retrieve weather data from the central area. Finally, we have the Weather App Assistant, an AI backed service engineered to retrieve weather data in response to text prompts made by the user of the Weather App. I'll provide a more detailed exploration of the service in an upcoming video. Thank you for watching and see you next time.